Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, good evening. I warmly welcome you to the opening of the exhibition Passports of Life, the, the small exhibition right there. My name is Mateusz Fałkowski and I am deputy head uh, of the Pilecki Institute in Berlin. This small exhibition was created as part of our research project on the activities of Polish diplomats and activists of Jewish aid organizations conducted in years 1942-1943 from the Swiss Bern. The project uh, in the Institute was based on archival findings from Swiss archives and archives of Jewish diaspora. And this research was initiated by our dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Jakub Kumoch, at that time, then ambassador, Polish ambassador to Switzerland. And the Polish embassy in Bern was at that time the first place in 2019 where this small exhibit was to be seen. Instrumental in the preparation of this exhibition was my colleague, Hanna Radziejowska. Uh, within our research project, we have identified over 3,000 names of people who received false passports uh, between 1942 and 1943. The passport, which allegedly came from Latin American countries as Paraguay, Honduras or Peru, were signed by Polish diplomats in Switzerland and handed over and uh, all the logistics organizations came from, from activists from Jewish relief organizations. Uh, now, uh, a short commercial break. I like to advertise the books that have been written on the subject. Uh, the first publication is of the Pilecki Institute itself with archival findings and the list of all identified names, all identified passports. And this is the, this is the, the very list, the very list we, uh, we uh, listed of names uh, with information about uh, uh, place of origin, about nationality, and we see that, that the group of the people who received this passport was, on, was not only Polish Jews, but in fact the Jews from whole uh, occupied Europe. Also, from, from, uh, from, uh, uh, also many passports got German Jews. And the second book I want to mention is uh, the very important book I mentioned for what reason, but uh, so this book is by Roger Moorhouse. Roger Moorhouse, uh, uh, the book is titled The Forgers, The Forgotten Story of the Holocaust's Most Audacious Rescue Operation. And Roger Moorhouse will be our keynote speaker later. Uh, and I also mentioned uh, about the very origins of this action, that it was originated in the Polish embassy in Bern. Uh, we, using this particular case, this particular example, we can see how important the state and state institutions can be in critical situations. Poland had such state institutions in exile, even though it was occupied at the time and, uh, and much of the crime committed by the Germans and the Soviets at the time was because of the lack of government in the occupied Poland. But, but in fact, Poland had its networks of government, networks of government in exile, and Alexander Wadosz was part of this particular network. We see how important the role of diplomats was and can be also now. They were the ones who were able to save the most people at that time. And as this effort was undertaken by, among others, by Polish diplomats, I will now ask the Polish diplomat, the Polish ambassador to Berlin, Mr. Dariusz Pawłosz, to take the floor. Uh, ambassador, please. Dear Mr. Morehouse, dear Mateusz, thank you very much for your kind invitation. I'm so glad 
to be here and I am very honored to take part on the opening of this very interesting exhibition. Dear ladies and gentlemen, in 1940, the Polish government in Paris, led by General Władysław Sikorski, decided to entrust the leadership of the Polish mission in Switzerland to Alexander Wadoś. In response, on the 2nd of May 1940, the German foreign minister Joachim von Ribbentrop informed the Swiss representative that Adolf Hitler was extremely angry that the authorities in Bern accepted Alexander Wadoś as the new Polish emissary of the puppet government. The Swiss foreign ministry did not give in and Wadoś became charge d'affaires of the Polish embassy in Bern. The relationship between the two neighbors war was tense. War was hanging by the thread. To make the situation worse in Switzerland, the so-called Reichsdeutsche were spying and were ready to help the authorities in Berlin at any time. One of the attempts to save Jews from the Holocaust was a campaign in Switzerland between 1941 and early 1942 to provide them with false Latin American passports. Here, the Polish embassy in Bern served as a contact point. The operation was led by the first secretary, secretary of the Polish embassy, Stefan Runiewicz, Vice Consul Konstanty Rokitski and Dr. Julius Kühl, responsible in the embassy for contacts with Jewish organizations. Alexander Wadoś supervised the operation of, the, of these diplomats. The blank passports were provided by the Paraguayan consul in Bern, Rudolf Hügli, and then handed over to Konstanty Rokitski. Once they had been filled in, they were again sent to the Paraguayan consul for signature and then forwarded by him to the Paraguayan government. Today, we will hear the eminent British or English historian, Roger Moorhouse, who will speak about the behind the scenes of the acquisition of Latin American passports and their legalization by the Polish embassy in Bern. I, myself, wish to applaud the Polish diplomats for their bravery. The scale of the risk they took during the Second World War was extreme. The so-called Wadoj Group but also other Polish diplomats in neutral countries during, during World War II, including Ambassador, Ambassador Tadeusz Roma, described in Roger Mulhouse's book, and Consul Wojciech Rychlewicz in Istanbul showed ex exceptional courage and sacrifice. Did anyone know the Polish government in London, informed by Jewish organizations about the activities of the Wadoś Group, stated, moments of humanitarian nature demands that we provide as much support as we can in these kinds of matters. Helping Jews during the Holocaust was part of the activities of the Polish diplomacy. Thanks to scholarly research, it can now be stated without exagger exaggeration that practically all Polish diplomatic missions that operated during the Second World War were not indifferent to the fate of Jews. Because Wadoś was not exemptional, as amply remarked by Ambassador Jakub Kumoch 
former Polish ambassador in Bern and currently our ambassador in Beijing in China. In recent years, Ambassador Kumoch, together with his staff, including Minister Councillor Paweł Gronow, my deputy, who is present here today, Paweł, show your nice face, <laughs> who is present here today, has carefully reconstructed the activities of the Wadoś Group and rekindled interest in this unknown story among academics, journalists and the general public. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the team of the Pilecki Institute in Berlin for organizing today's event to as well tell this remarkable story in German's capital. The heroism and mercy shown by the Polish diplomats in those inhuman times deserves our continued attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, now, uh, I want to uh, introduce our keynote speaker tonight. So the order of this book, uh, I may, maybe I only mention that all the pictures you see here at the slide is part, is, is, these are the persons who are the owners of these passports. And we created a special website, Passports for Life, so, which is to be seen also as part of this exhibition, and uh, you, it could be uh, researched or looked at uh, in internet. Roger Moorhouse is historian specializing in modern German and Polish history. Uh, the author uh, of important books, among others, as the forgers, but also, uh, 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 for example, the killing Hitler, the Third Reich, and the plots against the Führer. Berlin at war, life and death in Hitler's capital. The Devil's Alliance, Hitler pacts with Stalin. And uh, first to fight the Polish War, 1939. Roger is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and also a visiting professor at the College of Europe in Warsaw. Roger, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all very much for coming and for that wonderful introduction, uh, Mateusz. Thank you, uh, and Ambassador. Beautifully done. Um, I should... Uh, start, of course, by thanking those that uh, the giants upon whose shoulders I stand with this subject, uh, and that is the hard work of the Pilecki Institute uh, in putting a lot of that together. You've seen the uh, example of the, the Wadosh list, which has been compiled over many years. Uh, and prior to that, um, the inexhaustible energy and hard work of uh, the then, amb then Polish ambassador in uh, Bern Jakob Kumoch, um, who I uh, went to go and see and stayed in Bern with him uh, in the early, early days of this project. Uh, and I got a taste of that um, high energy approach that he had to life, I think, in general, but certainly to uh, research projects such as this. And I think, uh, I don't think, I know, uh, this book would have been literally impossible uh, without his hard work and without, as well, the, the hard work of the Pilecki Institute, which gave me tremendous uh, institutional and archival support as well. So it, it's only right and proper uh, for me to, to mention both uh, uh, Jakob Kumach and the, and the Pilecki Institute before I say anything else at all. Um, this book was... Um, in, in some ways, a sort of peculiarity for me. It sort of landed on my desk as an idea uh, back in what must have been 2018. Um, and it was, it was from a, a Polish friend of mine. Uh, an email came in saying this story is sort of bubbling under in Polish press and so on. Um, what did I think of it? 
I read, read the material that had been attached and I thought, actually, this is one of those stories that I think actually comes, comes around very, very rarely uh, in that it is something that is certainly new, I genuinely new to history, uh, and at the same time is not uh, obscure or irrelevant, is actually very relevant uh, and very pertinent to our understanding of the world, and in this case, our understanding of the Holocaust. Um, so for me, I found that a really tempting uh, prospect to take on the project, um, and the, the end result is what you've seen the forges. This is the American edition here. Um, that's what you're, you're seeing there. And my great hope for this is that just as the work of the Pilecki Institute has been so uh, exhaustive in trying to sort of track down those that received these passports to look at their life stories and see who's, who survived and, and, and who didn't, but this is hopefully going to reach a wider audience. And the great hope, and I would say even perhaps an expectation, is that there will be other individuals who will now come out of the woodwork. They will read this, they'll see a review in the newspaper, they'll read my book. And that semi-mythical Paraguayan passport that they had in their family history, that they never understood what it meant, they never understood where it came from, that, that finally that begins to make sense. And I said, it's my fervent hope, if not expectation, that there'll be more people that will come out of the woodwork as a result of this book. And I, I, I really look forward to, um, to hearing that. I want to say something this evening about um, the operation. I mean, we have heard a very, a very adept potted history of the operation from the ambassador. So in that sense, he has rendered me um, slightly uh, superfluous to proceedings in that respect. But I want to talk a little bit about, I think the title that I gave was The Politics of, of Holocaust Rescue. Um, the key phrase was doing the right thing, the politics of Holocaust Rescue. So I wanted to look a little bit at this particular narrative of the Wadosh group within that light, within the light of the, the wider story of the politics of Hol Holocaust Rescue. Because although these stories of people actually trying to assist Jews during the Holocaust are relatively common, we, we all know about Raoul Wallenberg, for example, we all know about Oskar Schindler, there are other examples that we can give, Irena Sendler, for example, in Warsaw, not as well known as she should be, incidentally, outside of Poland anyway. So there are a few of these examples that we do know, but they're still in the general sense, they're still rather rare. Uh, and this is where it comes down to this question of the politics of Holocaust rescue. What was it that enabled some people to help in the way that they did when the vast majority of us, it must be said, did not? So that's one of those questions I want to look at um, a little bit today. Just to start, I want to sort of paint you a little picture, and it's of one set piece in the book, if you like, which is where I talk about Alexander Wadosh, Polish ambassador in Switzerland, um, being summoned to the presence of the uh, Swiss foreign minister, Marcel Pile Gaulage, uh, in the uh, federal building in Bern. And he was summoned in October of 1943. And 1943 is a very crucial year in this story, because it's, 19, it's during 1943 that the Swiss state and the Swiss police clamped down quite hard on the Wadosh group. And again, this might sound surprising. Why would they be so concerned? Why would they try and stop a Holocaust rescue operation? Well, they were under pressure themselves. The Gestapo was in their ear, telling them that they had to clamp down on this production of illegal passports. Curiously, many of us will be surprised to hear that the, the State Department, the American State Department, was also in their ear telling them to clamp down on this illegal passport operation. When the Gestapo is on the same page as the US State Department, something's gone wrong somewhere. So this hints at my subject, is that the, the politics of Holocaust rescue. So Wadosh goes to meet Pile Goulage, and he is... He's been summoned there to answer for this 
Holocaust rescue operation, for this passport forgery operation, as Pili Golaj put it. And he is, I think, being, he's expected to back down by Pile Golaj. Pile Golaj and, his, and the policemen of the, of the Swiss police have in, pulled in and interrogated each of the members of the Wadosh group in turn. They've started to clamp down on the, on the various honorary consuls that they used for their passports, most notably Rudolf Hoogli, who produced about 70% of the paperwork that they actually issued. So they're in the process of trying to round up and, and close down this operation. And finally, the kingpin of the operation, the most important person, Alexander Wadosh, is called in. And the expectation is, I think, that he would back down, that he would apologize, that he would say, I'm so sorry, he'd make some excuse as if he didn't know what his staff were doing and this was all dreadfully irregular and please accept my apologies, dear minister, and it will never happen again. He didn't do any of that. He started off by appealing to Pile Goulage's better nature, we could say, by saying to Pile Goulage that this was an attempt to save good people from certain death, to appeal to that humanitarian nature. That didn't cut much ice with the Swiss foreign minister who had a reputation, by the way, of being, at the very least, sympathetic to the German uh, Nazi state to the north. He then went on, Wadosh, to a more practical tack. He said to Pile Golage that this actually had nothing to do with the Swiss government. The fact that they were producing illegal Paraguayan passports didn't matter to the Swiss because none of those recipients of those passports would ever expect to come to Switzerland. That was not part of the, the, the expectation of the plan. That didn't cut much ice with Pili Goulage either. Finally, and I think out of exasperation, Wadosh hit perhaps on the most important unspoken point and he accused Pili Goulage of anti-Semitism that his, his refusal to allow this to continue, his refusal to accept Wadosh's explanations for this passport forgery operation were down to a latent anti-Semitism. And it's very possible that that was justified. But this, in a nutshell, I think, is an example of why it seems that this idea of doing the right thing was so difficult because it didn't hurt Switzerland, it didn't hurt Pile Goulage. Switzerland, of course, is in a very difficult situation in World War II. It's independent, of course, it's not occupied, it's still democratic, but it has this overbearing neighbor to the north. It's essentially an island of democracy in a fascist sea. So it's, although it's nominally independent, nominal, it is independent, it has this curious relationship with its neighbors whereby it cannot ride roughshod over the concerns of Berlin. So it always has to, regardless of any ideological congruence between Pile Goulage, people like Pile Goulage and their neighbors to the north, it's always had to uh, tack to some extent to the German wind. So why was it so difficult beyond that? We'll come back to that question in a little while. So you heard about the operation. The operation that Wadash was there to defend, was there to try and uh, persuade the foreign minister to allow, con allow to continue, was, as we've heard, uh, 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 the production of Ill illegal, illegally issued uh, Paraguayan passports, primarily Paraguayan, also Honduran um, from San Salvador and other places. But about 70% of what they issued uh, was uh, Paraguayan passports. The group, which was Ambassador Wadosh, um, his deputy Stefan Rinievich, as you've heard, Konstanty Rokitsky, local staff Julius Kuhl, and then two uh, Jewish aid activists, um, uh, Abraham Silberschein and Chaim Eis, came together, actually in a very organic way, I would suggest, um, when 
and I say when, not if, um, the Hollywood version of this uh, story comes out, I'm sure they will have some uh, a very moving scene in a sort of smoky room where the, the six members of the uh, Wadosh group get together over cigars and say, well, gentlemen, the, the, this Holocaust, this dreadful thing is going on. What are we going to do uh, to meet that threat? That's not really how it worked. It was very organic. It started out with uh, individual letters from friends and, and uh, uh, acquaintances primarily of those Jewish activists in Switzerland, from desperate people in occupied Poland, in the ghettos, writing to them and saying, you must do something to help us. The origins, the real origins of it, in fact, predate the Holocaust, bizarrely. They, the very first recipients of Paraguayan passports go back to 1940, and they go back to the Soviet zone of occupation, as is often forgotten outside of Poland, uh, it wasn't just Germany that occupied Poland in 1939. The Soviets also took a good half of the country uh, and imposed their system on it. And one of the first recipients of one of these passports was a chap called uh, Leo Goldschlag. Uh, and he was uh, the brother of a, uh, a chap who was in uh, Lausanne in Switzerland, uh, working in a yeshiva in a Jewish school. And he was not happy with the treatment that he was getting from the new Soviet authorities. He found it very oppressive. Bear in mind, of course, the Soviets brought in a class hierarchy, just in the same way as the, the Nazis brought with them a, a race hierarchy in the West. The Soviets brought in a class hierarchy with all of its associated uh, persecutions. And he found that to be a very oppressive atmosphere. He was in Lvov at the time, now modern Lviv. Uh, and he wrote a letter to his brother in Switzerland begging him to do something to help. And his brother had these connections to the Polish embassy. And he went to see Julius Kuhl, and he asked Kuhl what might be done to help his brother. And the suggestion was made that if they could supply a Latin American passport, perhaps he could escape up into Lithuania and across the Trans-Siberian Railway to Japan. Sounds a very involved route, but that was the way was, that was being thought of as a, as a possibility at that time. And that's mainly down to a Japanese consul in Kaunas in Lithuania. His name was Kiyune Sugihara. And he was, in the summer of 1940, was busy issuing Japanese transit visas to almost anyone that asked for one, many of whom were Polish Jews seeking to escape the Soviet zone of occupation. So that was the, the sort of long tail to the Wadosh group. So by the time 1941 comes around, the German invasion of the Soviet Union, and the Holocaust gets going properly, as it were, that idea of systematic killing uh, of Europe's Jews, which is really um, the, the second half of 1941, then those letters that are coming out of occupied Poland, which had been a trickle, Begin, begin to form into something more like a flood. And this was the response, was to, was to try and supply these Latin American passports. And the main problem that they were addressing was that there was a, a bureaucratic precondition to the Holocaust, which was that the Nazis would make their would-be victims, first of all, into non-people where they had no representation, they had no valid citizenship, they had no rights. And a very good example of this is very clear in the, in the case of German Jews, who are, of course, a relatively small minority of, those, of the total of those that are killed in the Holocaust. But when German Jews are deported from Germany uh, in the autumn of 1941, they are presented on their deportation notice with the five or six paragraphs of German law upon which that deportation was based. So of course that made this a legal document. This was something that you couldn't just defy and ignore and carry on your life uh, as if it wasn't there. So the Holocaust process in that sense had this very important veneer of legality about it from the perspective of the victim. One of those paragraphs of law stipulated that when you were being deported, 
And when you passed across the German frontier, all rights that you had, all remaining civil and political rights that you had, which were few for German Jews after the Nuremberg Laws, but they did possess some, all those remaining rights, rights lapsed. So you became, as you crossed the frontier, you became a citizen of nowhere. You were a non-person. You didn't legally exist. Which meant, of course, that from that point on, the authorities, wherever you ended up, could do whatever they liked with you. And this was probably the last thing that most of those deportees were worried about when they crossed the frontier in 1941 or 42. But it was nonetheless a very important legal precondition to what was, whatever was going to happen to them from then on. So what this passport procedure did, this passport operation did, initially unwittingly, was to recreate the possibility that somebody somewhere cared about what happened to that individual. It recreated a legal framework within, that per within which that person fitted, which might sound like a sort of small, insignificant detail in the grand scheme of the Holocaust, but it was actually vitally important because it meant that when an individual holding one of these passports or the facsimile of one was being rounded up, for example, for deportation to Auschwitz. And they had the ability and the bravery to say to a guard, you can't do this to me, I'm a Paraguayan citizen. It meant that they would be pulled out of that deportation train. You were pulled out of that mechanism of the Holocaust and you were put into the concentration camp. So it didn't mean, of course, a free pass. It didn't mean you got to go to Paraguay. It didn't mean you got to even leave German-occupied Europe. But it took you out of the, crucially, it took you out of the mechanism of the Holocaust. So for the Germans, from a German perspective, 1942-43, they knew that most of those individuals waving Paraguayan passports at them, were not Paraguayans. For the simple reason that they were called Yitzhak Goldschmidt and they had lived in Warsaw all of their lives, they were Orthodox Jews, they didn't speak Spanish, they only spoke Yiddish, and they probably couldn't find Paraguay on a map. But from a German perspective, none of that mattered. And there's wonderful correspondence, which I, I talk about in the book, between the German foreign ministry and the SS, where the foreign ministry is much more ecumenical about this. It's much more rational and practical about this. And it says basically, well, we can leverage these people. And the fact that we can use them in some way, ideally to get hold of German citizens who are held abroad, so they re reclassified these foreign Jews as what they called exchange Jews. So they wanted to exchange them for Germans held abroad. So from a rational mind, that was a, a positive. The SS, of course, was much more unequivocal, much more brutal in its logic, that these people should be exterminated. They are not to be tolerated. They're not to be allowed to survive. But there was interesting correspondence between the two. And for a long time, the rational argument, the practical argument of the foreign ministry prevailed. And they were willing to take those individuals out of the deportation line, regardless of whether they believed them genuinely to be, to be Paraguayans or not. And in the most cases, I think they didn't. But they were willing to overlook that because they were, as long as the Paraguayans played ball, they were useful. So that's the essence of how this worked. And they ran through 1942 to 1943, the end of 43, essentially it's been closed down, as I described, by the Swiss authorities. Uh, and it's reckoned that the Wadosh group produced, uh, by their own estimation, their own estimation in January of 1944, it was estimated that they produced identity documents for some 10,000 individuals. And this makes this one of the most uh, ambitious, I would say. I use the, the word in the, thank you. I use the word on the cover of audacious, an audacious rescue operation. 
I don't mean audacious in the sort of conventional sense as in personally brave necessarily, but I think audacious in terms of ambition, in terms of the ambition that it demonstrated. And that I think is very significant, that this was in its intention and in its inception, one of the most ambitious Holocaust uh, operations of the war. All the more remarkable that it had been forgotten. So why was all of this then so controversial? Why was it so difficult to attempt to save Jewish lives during the Holocaust? I think when we look back, one of the key, key, key threads of this book is, I think, to sort of explode the myth that the outside world was uh, positively predisposed to the idea of, of Holocaust rescue. Uh, the outside world in general, I would suggest, was not, was at best indifferent to Jewish suffering in the Holocaust. In some cases, you could argue, was actually actively hostile to saving Jewish lives in the Holocaust. And I think when we look back in history, and we look back with 2020 hindsight, for one thing, and certainly with rose-tinted 2020 hindsight, I think we imagine that our forebears, British and American politicians and diplomats and everything else, were ready to help, willing to help, but were stymied in that ambition. They were prevented from helping by various concerns. Logistics, for example. You couldn't physically actually, you know, what could you do to help someone languishing in a, in a ghetto in occupied Poland? There was very limited uh, amount of things you could do. Or the grander sort of strategic concern that, and this was expressed at the time, that the priority for the, for the Western alliance was to defeat Nazi Germany, to win the war. And anything else, even shipping foodstuffs or attempting to ship foodstuffs to the camps, was wrong-headed because it distracted from that primary ambition, that overriding ambition to win the war as quickly as possible. That was the way. This was the logic that the Allies told themselves and everybody else. For example, at the Bermuda Conference in 1943, that was the ambition. Defeat Germany as quickly as possible, and that's the best way to save lives. Everything else is a distraction that we cannot afford. There's also the question of knowledge. I think this is one another aspect that when we look back, we imagine that knowledge of the Holocaust was very, very piecemeal. Perhaps we would say um, it was very difficult to know exactly what was going on in the Holocaust, really until the Nuremberg trials. Not true. You go back to 1942, December 1942, the Raczynski note issued by the Polish government in exile, gave an extensive collection of that, of that admittedly piecemeal intelligence about the ongoing Holocaust, packaged it up, presented it to the Western powers and said, in essence, this is going on. What are we going to do about it? So from then on, into 43, 44, it's very difficult for us to take seriously any Western politician who claims ignorance of the Holocaust, because the, the information is there. The information is there. It's worth mentioning, again, that the Polish government in exile played a crucial role, absolutely crucial role, in the transmission of that available intelligence little though it was in many cases, in transmitting that West, in communicating it to the wider world. And this is something that I think, I, would say, I was going to say doesn't get enough recognition. I don't think it gets any recognition at all in the conventional Western narrative of World War II. And it really should. And indeed, the, West, the conventional narrative of the Holocaust. I think it should. But crucially, I think this passport operation that we're talking about, it bypassed a lot of those 
objections. The logistical one, it bypassed that. It bypasses that grand strategic one. It didn't cost the Allies anything, perhaps, to get behind this. So crucially, after the end of 43, they stopped producing these passports because they'd been forced to by the Swiss. After that point, something like 10,000 individuals are languishing in various camps, the most famous of which being Bergen-Belsen, as recategorized as exchange Jews. Of course, you have to survive 18 months, perhaps, in Belsen, which is a tough thing to do. Belsen, of course, had one of the highest death tolls of conventional concentration camps, so accepting the, uh, the death camps. But of conventional concentration camps, Belsen has an astonishingly high death toll, almost twice what Dachau was, Dachau's death, death toll. And that's tribute to the collapse of conditions within uh, Belsen at the end of the war. That, of course, was the place, was the camp in which Anne Frank died in March of 1945, again, of, uh, I think, typhus in her case. So, with those individuals languishing in those camps, it would cost the outside world nothing to get behind this scheme, to, to sort of pressurize the Paraguayans to say, you must recognize these passports. This became the great question. What would, what would the outside world do? After they'd finished uh, producing those passports, the question became one of recognition of those passports. And then it was a diplomatic wrestle between, on the one side, the Polish government in exile and its diplomats, and on the other side, the Paraguayans, and again, the, the American State Department. Because if the Paraguayans said, those passports have been issued illegally, we are not going to recognize them, then those individuals languishing in the camps holding Paraguayan passports were no longer exchanged Jews, they were just Jews. And we know what happens to Jews in, Pol in German camps in 1944. So this becomes a question of recognition. So there are various problems here for the outside world, one of which is, well, obsessions, if you like. There's an obsession, I think, from the Swiss side, certainly, but also from the Americans, with bureaucratic propriety, where they objected on principle to the idea that not only that uh, the law had been broken and that these passports had been illegally issued, but that, in the, certainly in the Swiss case, but that diplomats and even the Polish ambassador himself was involved in the scheme. This was something to a Swiss mind which was absolutely unthinkable, that a, that a, a, a representative of a foreign country would be complicit in the production of false passports. The Paraguayans felt the same way. They felt that their good name in the world had been brought low, had been traduced by the fact that these passports had been issued in their name uh, without their uh, consent. And the US State Department was also angered by the issue of these illegally issued passports. And it said to the Paraguayans, we should not reward illegal activity. So they're in the ear of the Paraguayans, telling them to withhold their recognition of those passports. And as I said, if that recognition is withheld, those exchange Jews are just Jews, and they have no value at all. So there are various obstacles, if you like, mental and otherwise, to the outside world actually helping. But it's also more than that, and I come back to what perhaps overrides all of this, and that is the question of anti-Semitism. Latent, perhaps, uh, certainly of a different stamp, of a different breed to the type of Nazi antisemitism, that metastasized, brutal, biological antisemitism that we saw uh, from the Nazi regime in its, uh, in its execution of the Holocaust. So in the outside world, it could rightly look at the ongoing Holocaust with horror and damn all of those concerned. 
But that didn't necessarily mean that those politicians, diplomats, and uh, bureaucrats were not in some way anti-Semitic themselves. And you can see that again. I, I, I'm throwing the US State Department under the bus, and I do in the book. But the US State Department is consistently uh, against this passport operation, and consistently, I think, shows latent anti-Semitism. It talks about one of the first pieces of intelligence that comes out of occupied Poland about the Holocaust is in the summer of 1942. It's called the Regna Telegram. That was sent out with what was then the sum total of the knowledge that people had of the ongoing Holocaust, piecemeal bits of information put together in some sort of coherent form. It was sent out to the outside world. The State Department received that and essentially sat on the information, didn't, didn't release it to the press, sat on the information and dismissed it as a conglomeration of Jewish fears. So the State Department was consistently obstructing attempts at rescue. And this can't be just, as I said, an obsession with bureaucratic propriety. It can't be just an obsession with the restrictions of the logistical situation. At heart, it has to be some form of anti-Semitism. As I said, not the metastasized Nazi version, but the version that says, well, the Jews are not really our problem. They're somebody else's problem. Somebody else can deal with this down the line. We don't have to do it now. And this was exactly the same mentality as had been demonstrated at the Evian Conference in 1938, which of course predates the Holocaust, absolutely. But the attitudes presented there, if you look into the, I'll do a, do a section on the Evian Conference in the book, because it's so instructive. The attitudes presented at the Evian Conference, which was called to address the Jewish refugee problem in the aftermath of the Anschluss, the attitudes reflected there are of, this is not our problem. This is somebody else's problem. We will say all sorts of nice warm things about this refugee problem, but we will do precisely nothing about it. And those same attitudes are reflected in 1943 at the Bermuda Conference between the British and the Americans, who essentially, in the middle of the Holocaust, where there's really no doubt that the Holocaust is going on, but they still have the same attitude, is that any, any effort to help Jews in occupied Poland and elsewhere is a deflection from and a distraction from the wider war effort and should be resisted. It's the same attitude reflected at Evian as at Bermuda. Somebody else's problem, let them deal with it down the line. So you're left with the question, and this, and this bothered me while I was writing the book, is there something peculiarly Polish about, about Holocaust rescue in that sense? Because there are other examples. You heard a couple mentioned. Wojciech Rychlewicz, who was the consul in Istanbul during the war, uh, issued baptismal certificates perfectly incorrectly and illegally uh, to Polish Jewish refugees that managed to get to Istanbul, saved many hundreds of lives in the process. Again, he wasn't known about until the last few years. Another example, Henryk Sławik in uh, Budapest during the war, similar operation, uh, providing um, paperwork, providing accommodation for fugitive Jews. Again, many thousands, until he was caught by the Gestapo and executed. Um, Stefan Małęczyński, who was the consul in Marseille, was a crucial waypoint in the, uh, uh, the route through the Pyrenees, out through Franco's Spain, and that route west in 1940. And again, he was issuing documents as well. There are, of course, we should say, other diplomats involved in Holocaust rescue. Uh, Thomas Kendrick was the British passport officer in Vienna in 1938, again predating the Holocaust, but he was very generous in issuing uh, British papers to 
pretty much anyone that asks, explicitly against the, the, the wishes of his masters in London. Um, other examples, Ho Feng Shan was another, was a Chinese representative also in Vienna, um, who was very active in providing uh, passport, uh, visas to Shanghai, uh, building up that, uh, what they imagined would be a Jewish homeland in, in Shanghai. So there are other individuals as well, but there is a relatively large numbers of Poles here. Two things. The first one is, I think, by, by way of explanation, the first one is, I think, that perhaps it's different in Germany, but certainly in the British narrative of the war and of the Holocaust, there is not enough recognition that half of the victims of the Holocaust were Polish Jews. I think the assumption would be that they were probably German Jews. But that was not the case, as I'm sure we all in this room know. So given that the largest proportion of victims of the Holocaust are Polish Jews, it makes perfect sense that for Polish diplomats across occupied Europe and free Europe, like Bern, like Istanbul and elsewhere, their primary duty, never mind any humanitarian concern, but their primary duty was to help Polish citizens, or ex-Polish citizens, if you like, in peril. So that's one point to make. More than that, I would suggest, there is a, as again, I'm preaching to the choir, I appreciate, there is a strong tradition in Polish history and in Polish public life that goes back to the period of the partitions and goes back to that period of living under foreign occupation. We can call it conspiracja, whereby for those individuals, the idea of living a sort of double life, outwardly correct, and yet doing perhaps illegal things beneath the table in a subtle manner. This was something that for that generation of Poles like Wadosh was not folk history from 100 years ago. It was lived experience, as we would say today. This was something that they themselves had done as young men. And that's certainly the case with Wadosh. So the idea that doing the right thing overrode bureaucratic propriety in that example. The polar opposite from the Swiss opinion about the sanctity of official documents. So what did it mean? What, did, what, did, what was required for an individual to do the right thing in Holocaust rescue? You needed to have opportunity, certainly. And we can see that someone like Alexander Wadosh and his group in Bern had the opportunity to do something. They had the opportunity to produce illegally issued passports. But it's more than that, because there were any number of diplomats in Bern, and they weren't doing the same thing. So more than that, I would say, you needed to have the moral clarity to see that this was something that was necessary, that it wasn't just something for someone else to do at another time. It was for you to do now. And that they saw. Others, perhaps, didn't. And they also had to have the means, of course. They had to have some way by which they could help, which in this case, as we know, is the production or illegal production of passports. And crucially, I think, above all of that, above the opportunity, the means, and the moral courage to say what was right and what was wrong and what was necessary, I think you had to have an imagination. You had to have the imagination to see that this was possible and that this could potentially save lives. And all too often, I think it's that element, perhaps, which is, which is lacking. It's that question of imagination. I think we all like to think that if we were to be tested in a situation similar to this one, that we would meet that challenge, that we would end up on the side of the angels. But the truth, I think, sadly, is much more complex 
And for this reason, we should, we owe it to history to remember and praise those who were able and were willing and that had the imagination and the moral courage to do the right thing. Thank you very much. If anybody has a question or comment, as other question to Roger, so please. So maybe maybe I can ask the first question, so you can think about. So the what? So you you name this this politics of Holocaust rescue, and uh, and my question would be. Uh, would be how how to measure success of this politics. So you 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 mentioned that that this is this is quite uh, important to know that uh, that this passport wasn't guarantee for survival, and uh, uh, and maybe the the main argumentation. So what how to measure the success or what is what was success was this moral economy of this very action. So how you perceive it? So what is success, what was not yeah. success? Yeah, I think it, it, in this example, I think because of, because of how it worked, as I've just explained, that they actually stopped producing these passports effectively at the end of 1943. And from then on, it became a question of those individuals that had received them effectively surviving the next, you know, potentially 18 months in German concentration camps. Um, it's very difficult because of the circumstances of this to measure its success or failure or worth on the basis of the numbers that survived because there are too many other factors that intercede, right? Um, and I think that's an, an important point to make is not necessarily to remember, I mean, we, we know from the Wadosh list that you mentioned, that I think the current number is something like 859, I think something like that, 850 plus. Um, individuals who were in receipt of these passports who we know survived. Now, it's, it's very important to say that we don't know, it's not necessarily the case that it was just because they had those passports that they survived. Um, it most certainly would have contributed in the majority of cases, but I know in many cases, for example, um, where the operation, um, where the sort of focus of the, of the German operation uh, of, of finding these exchange Jews, they sh consciously shifted it to the Dutch um, through in early '43, and the logic of that was quite simple. So again, put yourself in the shoes of you know an SS Sturmbannführer in 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 his office in uh, in in Berlin, um, dealing with this stuff. The logic is simple because if you're going to allow some of these people to survive, which is what you're doing. You want the ones who actually don't, comparatively, don't really know chapter and verse of what you've been doing in the East with these subject populations. And Polish Jews knew chapter and verse of what was going on in the Warsaw Ghetto, in, you know, the Łódź Ghetto, in Benjin, whatever it was. They knew chapter and verse. So these were not the people you want to allow to survive. In comparison, Dutch Jews, not to downplay the horrors that Dutch Jews had endured, but they knew a fraction of the reality of what was going on on the ground in Poland, which of course is the occupied Poland is the epicenter of the Holocaust. So there's this conscious shift on the German part where they shift to Dutch Jews. Um, the result of that, of course, is to go back to my earlier point, is that a lot of those Dutch Jews have more in the way of means than Polish Jews, so they have the opportunity to, to spend money to get, to get other forms of documentation which might help them save their lives. So in many cases that I've seen, and I've mentioned in the book, Dutch Jews, many of whom had been German Jews who had escaped into, into Holland, um, used a suite of measures to try and survive. So they would get hold of a Wadosh passport they would get hold of a, a, a fake Dutch ID from the Dutch underground. 
they would get hold of Pal Palestinian emigration papers. And then it's a question of which one of these was decisive in their survival. So we can't say for definite that it's because they had this passport, that's why they survived, okay? That's too, that's too easy to say, and it doesn't really fit the history. Um, but still, we know about 850 plus that survived with these passports. Um, that's a, a, a small fraction of the 10,000 that were, that were issued, that they, by their own estimation, were issued. But the reasons for that disparity are all to do with circumstances, the fact that they end up in places like Belson, which is dreadful, um, and that's where, that's where that disparity comes from. So to judge this scheme on the 800 rather than the 10,000, I think is, is profoundly unfair in a way. We need to judge it on its intent uh, and what was within its gift to, to try and, to try and uh, make happen. So that, that's one of those, it's, it's often said, you know, it has been said before, where it's, this, this uh, particular operation is criticised, well, they only saved a few hundred Jews. But it's what's, what's much more important is to remember the ambition of the original plan, which was for 10,000. Mm -hmm. So maybe some questions, so please. I must admit that I don't know, um, I'm not familiar with the phenomenon of exchange Jews. Could, could you explain what this uh, implies? Yeah, um, that's a really key element to this whole operation. So the German authorities, then in occupied Poland, are increasingly in sort of 1942, end of 41, but into 1942, are increasingly finding foreign Jews in their midst. So people who, a small minority of them were people who, uh, like there's a famous diarist called Mary Berg, who you might have read, she was in the Warsaw, in the Warsaw Ghetto. She actually had an American passport. So she, uh, I think her mother was American. So she had genuine American passport. And she was taken, into the, uh, into the uh, 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 German administration as an exchange Jew to be exchanged at some point in the future with Germans held abroad. So the key thing is that when they're increasingly seeing lots of these foreign Jews coming forward, foreign in inverted commas, the majority of them being, you know, Paraguayans and others, not genuine foreigners, but that didn't matter. They see this as a, as a potential, the Germans see this as a potential uh, uh, positive for them, that they can exchange these individuals for Germans held abroad. So at the outbreak of war, there are lots of Germans held, mostly in America, who were German citizens who perhaps had been working in America, or they'd been living there for a couple of years, but they were still German citizens. Um, and they were rounded up by the Americans. We hear about the internment that the Americans did with, with the Japanese during World War II. That's quite well known. It's less well known that they also rounded up German uh, citizens as well. So for the exchange Jew program, if you like, from a German perspective, it was to get those people back because they saw those people as worthwhile. So you're getting rid of, if you like, your as they would have seen it, your human trash, Europe's Jews, and you're getting something worthwhile back, which was Germans held abroad. That was the logic of the exchange Jew program. And crucially, as I said, it didn't matter to the authorities, German authorities, whether they were genuine Paraguayans or not. It merely was important that they had foreign paperwork. And as long as that was gonna be recognized, then in theory, this exchange plan could carry on. Crucially, there was only one exchange that was ever carried out. So the Germans were sort of collecting up these, so they, they had a couple of them earlier on, um, 1940, 41, there's a couple of very early exchanges with the Americans. So prior to the Ameri American entry into the war, there was a couple of exchanges there, but it, it didn't really work very well. And, and the Americans weren't very happy with what they got because they realized that most of these people weren't actually Americans. So they weren't very happy with it. So it sort of closed down. Um, and then there's one exchange in January of 1945, which is of a couple of hundred Jews from Belsen who were taken to Switzerland in exchange for Germans. So what the Germans were doing were constantly collecting foreign Jews 
and keeping them in concentration camps in the hope that they could restart that exchange program and exchange, as they saw it, bad blood for good blood. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, you mentioned about the, um, the stance of uh, the United States um, office. I don't remember the name. Um, State Department? Yeah, State Department towards these uh, um, passports. Were they aware of how they've been used and for what they've been used, those passports? That's the first part of the question. The second is, um, is this some kind of continuation of uh, pre-war restrictions on, for example, emigration to British Mandate Palestine? And how about the after-war restrictions on emigration of IDPs in Europe, uh, Jewish IDPs, to British Mandate Palestine too. Okay. Um, so the State Department first. The State Department, from, from what we can tell, um, did know broadly how this was supposed to work. Um, there's, a, there's a memo, which I quote in the book, which it dates from 1944 from memory, Um, and it was a State Department official saying that, you know, the idea that these people who have foreign passports um, will be killed if those passports are not recognized by the outside world uh, is a fiction. So they're saying that this isn't going to happen, uh, which, of course, is, is not true. That's, I mean, precisely that happened uh, through 1944, particularly, you know, large groups of Um, exchange Jews of these, uh, a lot of them being Polish Jews with Wadosh passports, are shipped from Belsen to Auschwitz and exterminated. Uh, and it's because of this wrestle about recognition, because the Paraguayans initially said they weren't going to recognize those passports, largely because of the Americans in their ear. Um, and then they sort of relented and they said they would recognize them. And by that time, you know, it, it, was, it was to a large extent too late. So the, from the State Department's perspective, they do appear to have understood the basics of the, of the program, but they still didn't want to um, recognize, as they put it, illegal activity. They didn't want to grace that with their, with their blessing. Um, so it seems that they seem to fall into, I think, I think there is an element, there's always an element, I think, here of anti-Semitism as well, but I think Broadly as well, they're motivated, like the Swiss were, by this idea of sort of bureaucratic propriety, that, you know, you, you don't forge passports, you know, even in the extremists, even in the case where trying to save people from certain death, you don't forge passports, you don't forge official documents. And that was seemed, seemed to be ver a very offensive concept to a lot of people, which might surprise us, but it, 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 just, it just was. Um, One of, the or one of the ideas that seems to have been misconstrued um, is the idea, as I said at the beginning, that these people were not intended to ever go to Paraguay, right? Um, now, that was made clear, I think, it was made clear to the Paraguayans that the great um, engine of, of this sort of fight, this bureaucratic fight for recognition on one side is, again, is the Polish government in exile and its diplomats. So its diplomats across uh, Latin America were, you know, speaking to their counterparts in those governments, and they were, con and in London and Washington, they were contacting anyone that would listen, you know, the Pan American Congress, the Vatican, you know, anyone to basically put pressure on the Latin American government's concern, mainly Paraguay, to publicly say that they would recognize those passports. But the great fear from the Paraguayan perspective was that this meant or would mean that Paraguay would be inundated with poor, ill uh, concentration camp survivors, Jewish, which to them was, was unacceptable. But that was never the intention. So I think there's a, there was a, a, a great misconception. And I think the Americans fall into that as well of seeing this as, as a migration issue, where it wasn't. But the intention was never that they would even leave Europe. It was just that they're taken out of the mechanism of the Holocaust. So they, they did know a lot about it. They understood enough about it. But I think there were still mis crucial misconceptions like that one. 
Um, the other question was about the Palestine certificates, you said, about um, Palestine immigration certificates. That was another, another aspect I think is very, it was very significant because it was another way out, potentially. Um, it was rel they were relatively easy to come by. Uh, they're effectively giving them out at the Hotel Polsky, for example, in uh, 1943 in Warsaw. Um, they're giving them away, pretty much, when British passports cost a lot of money. So um, that was another method by which people could potentially escape. Um, again, the, the, the question of which one was decisive in an individual's su survival is almost impossible to answer. Uh, actually, very often, and you can see this from the German accounts of uh, Belsen, um, they used to send the commissions into Belsen to interview those foreign Jews uh, to ascertain, I mean, they knew very well that they weren't Paraguayans through this process. As I said, they knew they couldn't speak Spanish, they, didn't, they couldn't find Paraguay on a map, um, but they were willing to go along with it because it benefited them. Um, but... Through those commissions, you can see that uh, well, they asked individual uh, foreign Jews, exchange Jews, to, to choose if they had more than one document or more than one means of potential rescue. They would ask them to choose one. You can only choose one. You can't have three. You, know, you can't have a Wadosh passport, a Palestinian certificate, and say, you know, Dutch ID. Which one are you... Which one are you which card are you going to play? Um, and, and the individual had to choose. And there's a wonderful account there. That I remember this particularly with Dutch Jews because they very often had a number of different options. Uh, and they, and they, they would say, well, we don't know wh which one is going to help us most. And it was almost impossible to tell. So it's kind of one, another one of those moments of sort of jeopardy where upon which an individual's fate could turn. Um, there are a lot of those, as you can imagine, in a book like this. Um, so yeah, the, the, the Palestine certificates are, are significant in that sense, but it's, it's almost impossible to ascertain you know, precisely where they fit in that sort of grand scheme of, of enabling survival um, for all those reasons. And Professor Morehouse, many thanks for, for this fascinating lecture. Um, <clears throat> I'm a Polish diplomat myself and started my career actually in, in Bern in Switzerland, but I didn't know many details of, of the story, so thank you very much. And um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, first of all, you mentioned you know, the, the approach of, of, of the Swiss uh, Foreign Office and, and, and their sort of limited mentality and, and, and this, this doubt about you know, being diplomat and being able to forge documents. But I think just to, to give them also a bit of credit, you should also mention Karl Lutz, who was a Swiss diplomat in, in, in Budapest, and, and he saved. He was involved at the time of Raoul Wallenberg, mm -hmm. so in rescuing Jews, 60,000, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, were, were saved or yeah. at least given, given documents uh, because of this diplomat. Yeah. But after he returned to Switzerland, I think there's a beautiful documentary also on this. He was not very much welcome. <laughs> back home so indeed and i think he was even dismissed from the foreign office so this this very yeah. much you know uh, collides with your with your but but that that was very common i mean you saw the same thing you know sugihara in in kaunas in 1940 is is being inundated with uh, you know polish jews basically saying help us help us uh, and he messages tokyo to say what should i do can i issue documents to these and they said no and he thought well i'll do it anyway and he, he saved probably two and a half thousand lives by doing so. But then when he went back to Tokyo, again, like the example you just gave, um, was roundly condemned by his own superiors for, for breaking the rules and for disobeying orders. Uh, and the same thing with Thomas Kendrick. Uh, Thomas Kendrick, the British passport officer in Vienna, uh, doing the same thing in 1938, uh, was condemned for it by the, by the British Foreign Office because he's breaking the rules. So there's this lack of, as I said, there's a lack of imagination. Um, certainly, I mean, humanitarianism on one side, but also a lack of imagination, I think, uh, in many of these cases. And it's interesting that in the case of the Wadosh group, um, they, as, again, when the, <laughs> if there's a, ever a film version of this, it would be a wonderful scene. 
But in the summer of 1943, Wadosh receives a telegram from London, from the government in exile, um, saying, we've heard from the Jewish aid agencies that there's a possibility for saving Jewish lives using, using Latin American passports. Can you investigate? And he basically writes back and said, well, you're just telling me what I've been doing for 18 months. Um, you know, thanks for explaining my, my operation to me kind of thing. Um, and of course, he hadn't told London that this is what he was doing. And we can only speculate on why, because there's no record as to precisely why he didn't tell London. Part of it, you can, you can say, is probably operational security, that an operation like that, you don't necessarily want to involve people and tell people of what's going on that don't really need to know in case the, the operation is compromised. But I think also there's probably an element here where he didn't want to be told no by, by London. Um, now, thankfully, in that case, when he went back and said, this is what I've been doing, the Polish government in exile in London was entirely supportive and said, you know, wonderful, and, you know, let us, we'll supply funds, and they supplied a lot of the funding for it uh, from then on. Um, very supportive. They kind of misunderstood it a bit, so they started sending lists of people that they wanted to be saved, um, as if you can just sort of go and find somebody in the Warsaw Ghetto. What was, not that it existed by that point, but anyway, you see the point. Um, so they kind of misunderstood precisely how it worked, but still, they, what's quite edifying about it is that they were at least supportive once they knew. But it's instructive, I think, that he didn't tell them in the first instance. And that's for the same reason I think that you're describing. Okay, if I may just um, uh, one, one more thing. The, how is the story perceived in Israel? And, and maybe you could give us some insights also into the, uh, these attempts to, for, for especially Wadosh to be recognized in Yad Vashem. And yeah. Why has he not been recognized up till now? Um, yes, it's true. I'm Konstantin uh, Rokitsky, uh, who it must be said was the one that really did most of the sort of legwork, most of the hard hard work on this, whose, whose handwriting is on the passport. So when you, if you get to have a chance, do go and you know, look at the exhibits over there. Um, he's the one that actually filled out the passports and then they're taken back to Rudolf Hoogley to be stamped and signed and so on. Um, Konstantin Rokitsky was recognized by Yad Vashem uh, among the righteous in, I think, 20, 2018, 2019, something like that. Um, which is rather anomalous. I think the explanation for it, for, for it just going to him, was rather, I think was rather weak. Um, of course, it's only to non-Jewish uh, Holocaust rescuers, so logically it should apply, I think, to, to Wadosh himself, Rinievich, and Rokitsky. Um, my hope is that with um, work that's been done by the Poletsky Institute, for example, I know they've made a second application to Yad Vashem, to, to ensure that the other two are recognized in the same way, which I supported at the time. I hope that that will be successful um, because it just seems, it seems right and proper. You know, any, uh, any risks that Rokitsky underwent, the other two underwent as well. And I think it's a misunderstanding of, of how the operation worked to just recognize Rokitsky. Because as, as I described at the beginning, you know, Wadosh going into the office of the foreign minister and arguing very hard to enable his operation to continue uh, is proof that he was really quite closely involved with this. Even if he wasn't actively filling out the passports in the same way as Rokitsky was, he was intimately, and, 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 uh, uh, and intimately involved and, and essential to it. So I would hope that this is just a question of an oversight initially, bureaucratic oversight, and it's a question of time. This is still a very new story. So, you know, Yad Vashem, like many institutions, uh, takes its own glacial time to actually do things like this. So I am hopeful that this is just an oversight and it will, it will be dealt with in due course. Aside from that, of course, there has been a sort of diplomatic spat between Poland and Israel over the last few years. That hasn't helped matters, but I would hope that you know, this will all come right in due course. Um, as to the sort of wider story with Israel, I mean, Israel has, um, I mean, as we know, 
the Holocaust is sort of the you know the sort of founding story of in, of Israel in many ways, and it's a story that they are very they guard very jealously, which you can understand for that reason. And I think there's a tendency, and I've noticed that I hadn't really looked into this in any depth prior to this book, but there's a tendency that I have perceived, which is to, which I think in Holocaust studies generally, is to view the Holocaust uh, in a sort of surprisingly parochial manner, um, in that it's seen almost exclusively as a Jewish story. So the victims are all Jews, of course. The perpetrators are others, Germans, you know, their allies and so on. And rescuers kind of don't really fit into that narrative. You have this sort of tripartite um, um, structure, which goes back to the 1970s, of, of perpetrators, victims, and bystanders. And rescuers doesn't, obviously doesn't fit into that. I mean, that, that's a really kind of, well, not terribly useful division anyway, because, you know, they, they sometimes shade into each other as well, those three categories. So there's certainly no category for, for rescue in that. Um, so I think that, I think that in a sense, there needs to be a slight rejigging and a, re, and a sort of an opening up of a lot of Holocaust historiography, perhaps. That needs to evolve. And it's because of its sensitivity and because of its um, uh, essential nature as a sort of as as Israel's founding story entirely with justification it's a little bit held in a straitjacket and I think that needs to that needs to be opened up a bit we collect the last questions so, uh... um, yeah I would like to ask you uh, because in this um, campaign in this action uh, to rescue the Jewish lives uh, of course, the Polish diplomats played a major role, but uh, also the Jewish organizations or like uh, Chaim Eis or Abraham Zilberschein. Mm -hmm. um, if you can describe in two, three sentences what was the role of the Jewish organizations here, like what was their uh, primary role, what they did, and uh, can you estimate um, maybe also the proportion, so how much percent of the success of this action or of the uh, whole logistics of this action uh, was uh, done by the by the Jewish organizations, mm. by the Jewish representatives. Um, absolutely. I mean, to answer your last point first, um, they're absolutely crucial to it. I mean, it couldn't the operation couldn't work without them, in the same way as it couldn't work just with them on their own, because you needed that sort of diplomatic element, the contact to the to the honorary consul, and so on. Um, so that they're. they're uh, you know, all of the all of the elements of the group are sort of essential to its operation, but the Jewish aid agencies are really important because that's the that's the sort of the the first point of call for. I, I talked about these letters, perhaps that would come out, you know, from the from the ghettos and would you know, we need help, we need documents, whatever it is. Very often in code and how they were coded is a really interesting point, which I talk about in the book. Um, but the first, the, the place where those letters ended up was the aid agencies in the first instance. So what they tended to do, initially they sort of prioritized, you know, their own uh, networks of, of colleagues and, and acquaintances and friends and family and so on um, for uh, assistance. And then gradually, as I said, as, as the volume of those letters increased through 1942, then they have to do some sort of vetting procedure and they have to decide, as they do, actually there's a, the same thing as a committee set up in Warsaw, in the Warsaw Ghetto, where they actually decide who is eligible to write the letter in the first place, right? Because they want, you know, they realise at that point that they're facing an existential threat. And the intention is to save the best of, of, of Jewish life. Um, whether that be rabbis or journalists or artists or whatever, but you needed to save the best people. So they had to sort of prioritize who was going to write a letter. Uh, and they do the same thing in, in Benjin as well. So there's a sort of vetting procedure already going on there. And then there's another vetting procedure that goes on once it arrived, once those letters arrive in, in Bern, because the resources are limited, right? So that's a key part of what they did is to actually decide who, who gets a passport and who doesn't. Um, 
The other element you have to have to mention in which they are indispensable is in the finances, um, because a lot of in the early phase, so prior to where, as I mentioned before, when the government in exile gets involved and is very willing to fund the later phase of, of production, in the earlier phase, it's almost exclusively through those Jewish aid agencies that the, that the funds are supplied. And through individuals, but again, that's usually challenged through the, uh, channeled through the agencies themselves. So, in that sense, that was crucial. Now, now, it's worth saying the only person that actually made any money out of all of this is Rudolf Hoogley, who's the honorary consul. So, our, our Wadosh group make no money out of this whatsoever. It's worth mentioning. Um, but large sums of money change hands. And a lot of that, the vast majority of that, comes through those aid ag agencies. So in that respect as well, the aid agencies are absolutely crucial. Yeah, so this is, I think this is very interesting because actually, so, so this, this very aspect shows us that, that this politics of Holocaust rescue is also the politics of self-rescue. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that this, because of the Jewish, part, uh, Jewish partners involved and also the, the very decision of these networks to contribute to, the, to, the, to this final um, um, effort of, 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 of this action. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the very last question, please. Uh, Andre, my name. Thank you for the book. You mentioned... It's on. It's on. Yeah. Uh, 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 do, it does work. Oh, okay. Uh, you mentioned that Mr. Ladash was envoy of the uh, government in exile. Yeah. Uh, and for me, I'm kind of anarchist. For me, that's very important motive could it could possibly be a very important difference because uh, government in exile can I think I would think uh, can uh, can have luxury of principled thinking and principled action because yeah. they have no real politics yeah and that reminds me that the towering issue of passports in 20th century in Europe was Fritjof Nansen, mm -hmm. who was not a part of, of any state. And that Polish uh, conspiracy thing went like for the better part of 250 years, like, like 20 years of Pilsudski were like the only time in the long time mm -hmm. that they have the state, state. Yeah. state interest and stuff like this. And so for me, this is very actually anarchistically obvious. And I think that a German uh, dissident diplomat, a Graf Schulenberg, he would take a different road. He wouldn't issue passports. Mm. So my question is, uh, what's this, how the tradition of diplomacy, which exists in the state confines, modern diplomacy, diplomacy after the World War II. Consider this as a founding myth, an important myth, how it affects actual, you could imagine, you, you probably talk to a lot of diplomats. Okay. Do they consider these people as a role examples? As, okay. As, yeah. um, I think on that particular point, I think it's too early to say, because this is still, as I said, a very new story. Um, I'd like, I did give a talk to the Polish Diplomatic Academy um, earlier this year, I think it was. Um, so, I mean, obviously, and we've got a few diplomats or, um, in this evening. Um, it is a significant story for Polish diplomacy, obviously, because it's a very, you know, it's a heroic chapter for them. So it's quite natural that they would um, take that on as a sort of guiding light, in a way, in the same way as, you know, the German military has Stauffenberg, in spite of all the all the bad stuff, it has Stauffenberg as a sort of a guiding light. Uh, in, in, uh, so, it, you know, it clings on to that. Um, so, a short answer to your question specifically is it's too early to tell, but, you know, I mean, that, that seems to show particularly the direction that, that the Polish diplomatic community is going, because they, you know, they are going to hold Wadosh up as a, as a hero in that way, which is right and proper, I think. The question, I think, is intriguing what you said about the government in exile potentially having the luxury of, I suppose you could say the luxury of irrelevance, right? Like, like Belarus. Yeah, exactly. yeah. That I would say, I would, I would push back on that because I think you could say that after 1946, 
you could say that the Polish government in exile in London, uh, once the communists had come to power, um, you know, they, all, they had their ultimate intention to go back and to take over again at some point. But while Poland was under the, under the, the jackboot, if you like, of the Kremlin, which looked like it was going to be permanent right up until the summer of 1989, let's be honest. Um, the government in exile, well, you know, which continued in operation in London and still had cabinet meetings and presidents and prime ministers you know, and, and ministry heads for a country that essentially didn't exist anymore, um, then I think you could say they had the luxury of irrelevance. In 1940 to 45... I don't think they did because they had the, the intention was always that, you know, this would be a, a transient moment that Germany would be in control. And at some point they would go back and they were always talking about, you know, how they were going to reshape the new Poland after the war. Um, and they were acutely aware of the demands of their Western allies. Uh, about things like, you know, um, you know, religious toleration, for example, toleration of minorities and all of that stuff. And they did a lot of hard work in that direction to reshape their policies as to how they foresaw a post-war Polish Republic. So I think in that period, I think they didn't have the luxury of irrelevance because they thought they were very, very relevant. And they saw themselves coming back to power and coming back to Poland, you know, in the, new, in the relatively near future after the Germans have been defeated. I think you can say that about the post-war government in exile, but not about the wartime, I would say. If that makes sense. So many thanks. So maybe the last, my short question. So what, Roger, so how do you think, so what, how many people were involved in this kind of network of uh, Holocaust rescuers? So do, can we can we say uh, anything? So this is you name some, a few people, I did. Uh, but but uh, but I, I assume that, that there should, uh, um, there were also other networks. Uh, there were also people who were in a way self rescuers in the ghetto of Beijing or some other places. So what what do you think? So what is what did the level more or less? So is can we say anything? That's a very good question, actually. My first instinct, if, you, if, we, if we think in terms of these sort of rel relatively large scale and ambitious projects like this one, like Raoul Wallenberg, um, then your, your instinct says it's, it's very small numbers. But then the second thing to say is I remember doing, I did, you mentioned at the beginning with your introduction, you mentioned a book that I did about... 20, 10 years ago, called Berlin at War. Um, and there's a chapter in Berlin at War which talks about um, the Jewish experience in Berlin and the Holocaust and Jews going underground and surviving. Um, and it reminds me of that issue because all of those examples, and I remember there was a wonderful quote from one of those that survived, Jewish Berliner who survived, and he had false papers, and he lived in safe houses all the way through the war, from 41 onwards all the way through. Um, and he said that at the end of the war, he compiled a list of all the people that had helped him. And they were all non-Jewish Germans. And he counted 63 names. And that's quite instructive. When we talk about Holocaust rescue, um, we have to bear in mind, as I think you alluded to with the question, it's not just these big operations, they're also just individuals who might help an individual. Um, and that still qualifies. And bear in mind, as, as I'm sure you know, you know, the largest number of, of um, uh, righteous among the nations by nationality are Poles. And the vast majority of those are ordinary Poles who might have, you know, helped one particular family. Now, part of that, of course, is because, as I said before, Poland is the epicenter of the Holocaust. It's where it's happening. It's where the vast majority of Europe's Jews were. So, of course, that's, that's where it's going on. But at the same time, I think it's tribute to that, um, you know, uh, the fact that even in the maelstrom of those days, 
uh, a significant proportion of people had not yet lost their moral compass. Um, so in the short answer to question is, is probably, a, the answer is it's a, it's a lot more people than we think it is. Uh, but, it's, but the vast majority of it is very small scale. Thank you. And uh, so I uh, very thank you so for this excellent talk uh, on the politics of Holocaust rescue. I uh, uh, should, uh, you can go through the through this exhibition. So this exhibition is made mostly on the basis of Heim Eyes uh, archive. So one of this of this activists of the Jewish diaspora. And uh, so in the lobby, in the foyer, so you can uh, also read, so there are some papers, and one of them in German, so is the, the paper of, uh, of Israeli journalist Eldad Beck about the Polish consul in Istanbul, about Wojciech Rychlewicz. So this is under the title, Der Engel aus Istanbul. And uh, I, yeah, so you can, you can take it, so you can read it. And I very thank you to, to the public, to you, so for being with us. Many thanks to Roger. My pleasure. Many thanks to all my cooperators, so to, to Marek, to Patrick and other people. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you.